Item number SCP-1901 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures All instances of SCP-1901-1 are to be held within a containment vault located within Site-77. All instances of SCP-1901 are to be covered with black cloth, which is to be recovered only for testing purposes. Any personnel believing that they may be affected by SCP-1901 are to report to their supervising researcher immediately. SCP-1901-2 are to be held in a separate containment vault, with personnel assigned to research it being given weekly psychological examinations. Any personnel displaying signs of SCP-1901-2 exposure are to be given psychiatric counseling, followed by permanent reassignment to projects not involving direct exposure to anomalous artifacts. Description. SCP-1901 collectively designates approximately 49 sheets of corrugated cardboard with varying anomalous properties, with the sub-designation of SCP-1901-1 and SCP-1901-2. All instances of SCP-1901 have the images of various celebrities printed on them. Each individual instance's shape roughly correlates with that of the subject it depicts. The words, Property of Full Humbug Associates are printed on each SCP-1901. Human subjects exposed to an instance of SCP-1901-1 without being informed of its true nature will perceive it as a human being identical to the person depicted. Subjects have not reported any movement or vocalizations originating from SCP-1901-1 instances. This effect will last until the subject attempts to interact with the SCP-1901-1 instance, at which point they will cease being affected. Photographs and videos taking of the SCP-1901-1 instance will also be affected. Subjects may express confusion or disappointment upon the cessation of the anomalous effect. No long-term effects have been found to occur from this type of exposure. Initially, all instances of SCP-1901-2 were believed to have an identical effect as SCP-1901-1. Footnote 1 Note that while all instances of SCP-1901-2 share SCP-1901's effect, the reverse is not true. However, intensive testing determined that if a specific context was provided to the subject prior to exposure, a secondary effect would trigger. If affected, subjects would perceive a fully three-dimensional humanoid with personality and appearance identical to that of the person SCP-1901-2 depicts. This effect persists as long as the subject is able to view the instance. When affected in this way, manifestations of SCP-1901-2 display sociopathic tendencies and total recall of the subject's memory. Manifestations created by SCP-1901-2 will attempt to persuade the subject to deposit them within an area where the instance is likely to be documented heavily. Subjects may use their clothes to disguise the SCP-1901-2 instance, and will alert local press groups to the possibility of the celebrity appearing at the location. If the subject accepts, making contact with SCP-1901 will no longer negate its effects. After an undetermined amount of documentation of the instance has been published, it will instruct the subject to take them to a new area and thank them for their assistance. Subjects will usually report positive memories of SCP-1901-2 manifestations. The initial 30 instances of SCP-1901 were discovered on 1978 after a number of reports originating from New Mexico, USA indicated that the deceased musician has been sighted numerous times. Agents arriving on the scene initially confirmed the sightings, until the arrival of additional agents confirmed SCP-1901-1's anomalous effect. After initial containment, SCP-1901-1 was classified as safe. On 1980, Agents embedded in the music label reported that several employees and artists may have been utilizing instances of SCP-1901 for personal reasons. Several persons believed to have used SCP-1901 were detained, as well as several instances of SCP-1901-2. During this investigation, documentation revealing SCP-1901-2's effect and the use of SCP-1901 dating back to 1965 were discovered. All anomalous artifacts were contained, with persons of interest being issued Class A amnestics. As of 1984, SCP-1901 had been reclassified as Euclid. Addendum: Document recovered from a person of interest connected to the music label. Dear Tommy, 
I'll be the first to admit the concept doesn't seem even a bit plausible. After all, it's a guy you've known for years, done shows with him and everything, but think about it, how much can you really recall about working with him? It's all sort of a blur. Rehearsal, the gig, the in-between can be hard to remember. That's not an artifact of our chosen profession, mate. It's the humbug doing its job. The tapes didn't lie. I don't know how that stuff got on the master recording, since it basically gave it all away. There really was a car crash in 66, probably the most ancient day I can remember. We were in a panic, though the band was about to go up in smoke. New as we were, none of us knew about Humbug. Lenny introduced us about a week after the funeral, and showed us the model. Took an awful long time to get used to, that did. Rehearsing and playing with a cardboard cutout, with nobody seeing it but you. Every time someone complimented the take, it was our instruction to smile and nod. Christ, if rehearsing was bad, playing the first gig was a nightmare. When it fell over in the middle of the stage, thought we were all washed up. Oh, we a little faith. Didn't change a thing. If you want to know the best place to look, Tim's the one to ask. Was the first humbug dealer I dealt with. Still one of the best. Going to him first will save you from so many rubbish dealers. Mention me, he might give a little bit of a discount if you aren't cocky about it. Nothing he hates more than cockiness, so watch your tongue. One last thing, don't try and treat the humbug like your old bandmate. It doesn't know any more than you do. That might have been what triggered the end, or at least made it more inevitable. Good luck, mate.